Hello everyone and welcome to this talk on the science of mindfulness, a research-based path to well-being uh, by Dr. Ron Siegel. Um, my name is Jessica De Simone. I am one of the co-chairs of the HKS Green Team and I have been um, running weekly meditation sessions at HKS for about five years now. And uh, we have, we occasionally use recorded meditations and we've been using Ron Siegel's meditations for the full five years. I am a huge fan. I highly recommend them. And uh, we're just very, very excited to have him here with us today in this virtual reality talking about mindfulness and um, the path to well-being through it. So a little bit about Dr. Siegel, if you're not familiar with him and his work. He is Assistant Professor of Psychology part-time at the Harvard Medical School. He's been teaching there for over 35 years. He is a longtime student of mindfulness meditation, and he serves on the board of directors and as faculty um, at the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. He is also affiliated with the Center for Mindfulness and Compassion at Cambridge Health Alliance, which is a Harvard teaching hospital. And um, if you're not familiar with them, we highly recommend you check them out. He is the co-director of the annual Harvard Medical School Conference on Meditation and Psychotherapy. And he teaches internationally about the application of mindfulness practice and psychotherapy and in other fields. He is also author, co-author and co-editor of many books. Um, he is author of The Mindfulness Solution, Everyday Practices for Everyday Problems. He is co-editor of Mindfulness and Psychotherapy, which is in its second edition, and of Wisdom and Compassion in Psychotherapy. He is also co-author of Sitting Together, Essential Skills for Mindfulness-Based Psychotherapy, and of Back Sense, a revolutionary approach to halting the cycle of chronic back pain. So welcome, Dr. Siegel. We're super excited, and I'll turn it over to you. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. And uh, what we're going to uh, focus on today is uh, a little bit about what mindfulness practices are and what compassion practices are, um, but particularly on the sort of science behind it. And I'd like to, um, to mostly emphasize why we need these practices, why they can be helpful to us, um, in part to motivate us, frankly, to, to practice, because they're, um, I've certainly found them to be personally and professionally uh, quite helpful. Uh, you know, have you ever noticed that in the, um, uh, United States Declaration of Independence, there's this line guaranteeing all of us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we hear that ever since we're children, and many of us don't step, step back to reflect, why do we have to pursue happiness as though it's some kind of a fugitive? Why doesn't it occur more naturally in human experience? And I would argue that the reason for that is we didn't actually evolve to be happy. And this is the, this is the, the sort of... Uh, um, uh, science-based focus to this. You know, when I went to uh, clinical psychology graduate school, um, our training, uh, training clinicians, you know, to do psychotherapy and uh, evaluate and treat patients, uh, we were in the basement and up on the fifth floor was the comparative psychology lab. That's where they had uh, all of the animals. And, and, you know, to my mind, it was like, well, I don't know why these people exactly are wasting their time on this. I mean, you know, so much less interesting than uh, stories about people, but we used to go up, you know, just to look at them. It was kind of like visiting the zoo sometimes. Uh, now, decades later, I think, they were onto something. Basically, most of what goes wrong for us as human beings has to do with the fact that we, like other mammals, evolved for survival, not for well being. And these very survival mechanisms, the ones that have been so useful for millennia in allowing us to thrive and, in fact, dominate and now being at the point of destroying the planet, these very mechanisms are precisely the same ones that cause us so much misery. So let's, let's imagine for a moment, and um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll share a slide here because I, th I think it's evocative. Um, uh, let's see, let's, let's start here. Uh, can you see this picture of, uh, of Lucy? Uh, Lucy is our ancestor. Uh, she's in fact our great 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 grandmother. And she was hanging around on the African savanna around four plus million years ago. And we know that she survived because we have her DNA. But how did she possibly survive? Well, she had a number of things going for her many of which are the very same things that cause us a lot of misery today. 
Some don't cause a lot of trouble. She had a prehensile thumb, right? The ability to grasp things, and that was gonna be very helpful for turning into homo habilis someday, you know, the, the tool maker. Um, she, that was helpful. She wasn't very fast, of course. You know, one of the first things you learn if you ever go on a so-called walking safari in Africa, the guides will tell you, no matter what happens, don't run. Why? Because everything out there that's scary is faster than you are. You see that lumbering hippopotamus over there in the mud puddle? 48 miles an hour when he gets going. See the half blind rhino behind the tree? 36 miles per hour. And worse, if you run and they're predators, they're gonna think of you as prey and that'll make matters even worse. So she wasn't able to escape that way very, very readily. Um, her vision was okay, better than the rhino, not as good as a giraffe, not as good as a giraffe or an eagle. Um, you know, were she to come face to face with a lion, you could imagine her relying on her aggressive instincts, but with a lion probably wasn't gonna be all that effective. By the way, she's only about a meter tall. Um, you know, her hide wasn't gonna offer much protection. Her sense of smell was quite limited, just ask your dog. So what else did she have going for her besides the, besides the prehensile thumb? Well, she was a social animal, so that meant she could cooperate with others. And as it turns out, that's actually gonna be one of our pathways to happiness that mindfulness helps us with. So she had that going for her. But the main thing that she had going for her that was really quite beyond what other animals had was this capacity to think, right? She could analyze the past and think, hmm, how did that turn out the last time? And structure things to maximize future pleasure and avoid future pain. But her thinking capacity was not just some um, objective, neutral computer. Her mind, her brain, evolved what we call a negativity bias. And this negativity bias is still very much alive in our brains today. And here's how it works. Uh, if any of you are in the research field in, in any discipline, you're familiar with what we call type one and type two errors. They're the two ways that we can get things wrong in the world. So let's imagine that Lucy was out there on the savanna and she's looking at some bushes and behind those bushes, there's a bay shape. And Lucy goes to make a type one error, a false positive error. She'd say, oh my God, it's a lion, when it's really just a beige rock. She might make a type two error, which would be to say, no, I think it's a beige rock when it's really a lion. Now, Lucy could have made countless type one errors, errors and still live to tell. One type two error, that's the end of her DNA line. So we might imagine that there were happy hominids in Lucy's day, holding hands, singing kumbaya, telling stories about luscious pieces of fruit and dynamite sexual encounters. But those, statistically speaking, were not our ancestors. Why? Because they died before they got to reproduce. Our ancestors were the ones walking around the savannah going, oh my God, it's a lion. Oh no, not another poisonous snake. Uh oh, another one of those plants with thorns. Oh no, a cliff. Remember what happened to Uncle Charlie? Those were our ancestors, right? And that is the brain that they bequeathed to us. So we have this very strong negativity bias that my friend and colleague uh, Dr. Rick Hansen says, made our brains like Velcro for bad experiences and Teflon for good ones. The bad experiences stick, the good experiences whoosh, slide right off the pan. And given that our brains evolved to be thinking all the time, this means they also evolved to create a lot of distress. Now let's look at how this distress manifests in us. And to understand this, I'd like you to imagine the experience of this bunny. I've tried to find a photo of a well-adjusted human. I haven't come up with one yet, but this bunny is extremely well-adjusted. And let's imagine that he's hanging out in the grass as you see him now and chomping on the grass. And he hears something, looks over and he spies a fox. He's gonna have a very predictable response. He's gonna orient toward the fox, right? His ears are gonna perk up and they'll actually turn toward the fox. They're very cute when they do that. And he's gonna have all sorts of psychophysiological changes. His heart rate's gonna go up, his blood pressure is gonna go up, his body temperature is, is gonna go up, all of his skeletal muscles are gonna tense so that he can fight or flee. Um, the tiny muscles at the base of his hairs are going to contract and that's to make the hair stand up to look big and ferocious. Now we may think that's silly, but those are our goosebumps. You can imagine how many lions we've warded off with goosebumps over the years. And this is 
what he's getting ready to do, he's either going to freeze or if he sees fight, bunnies aren't big fighters, probably won't do that. Or if he sees an opportunity, he's going to skedaddle out of there. Now, if the fox wanders off, everything's going to return to baseline in, I don't know much about veterinary uh, stress, but you know, probably in a human, it would be 10 or 20 minutes. It would, everything would return to baseline. But this bunny, while very adorable, is a poor primitive creature that has none of our sophisticated capacity for planning, reflection, and abstract thought, that very thinking capacity that allowed us to survive. So if he were sophisticated like us and the fox wandered off, he'd be able to think, I wonder where the fox went. Maybe he went to the next field where my wife and kids are. Maybe he went to his den to tell his friends about me. Damn. And if he were really sophisticated, he'd be able to think, hmm, do I have enough carrots in my 403B to make it through retirement? And other kinds of concerns. So part of our evolutionary accident here, and perhaps our most powerful one, in terms of creating a lot of um, psychological distress for us, is this thinking capacity, which was so helpful for survival, and this fight or flight system, which we share with all of the other mammals, wind up interacting in a way that keeps us agitated a lot of the time. Because what happens is our brain evolved virtually to secrete thought all day long. We're thinking, 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 thinking. And many of these thoughts are about things that might go wrong, referencing things that did go wrong in the past. And the result of this is an awful lot of agitation and a lo an awful lot of um, difficulty. Sorry to say it gets even worse in terms of our evolutionary history. We evolved to be extremely concerned with social rank. I'll give you an example. There's a stress physiologist at, uh, at Stanford. You know, Stanford, they call us the Stanford of the East. Uh, the stress physiologist at Stanford named Robert Sapolsky, who should win a Pulitzer simply for the title of his book. It was uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. He's a great science writer. And uh, he spent most of his career hiding behind blinds of vegetation in the African savanna, staring at bab baboon troops. And I once heard him interviewed by Terry Gross on NPR, and Terry was asking him about his life's work, and he was explaining that he and his colleagues would wait for particularly juicy soap opera interactions, shoot anesthetic darts, anesthetize the baboons, draw blood and learn something about stress physiology. So Terry asked him, so what'd you learn? And he said, well, the first thing we learned was it's quite challenging to anesthetize a troop of baboons without screwing up their stress hormones. Somehow they got past that. Said anything else? Said, the next thing we learned was stress physiology was fantastically complex. It's not just about adrenaline. It's about all sorts of hormones that interact in complex ways, depending on what's happening interpersonally among the primates. And you're probably familiar with Terry. She's a good interviewer and she was looking for a take home point. So she asked, is there anything that's really stood out over the years in your, in your study of this? He said, yes, there is one really robust finding. What's that? It turns out to be very bad for your health to be a low ranking male in a baboon troop. And we may think as the smart monkeys with a little less fur that, you know, this doesn't apply to us. But the way this shows up in us as human beings is with concern over self-esteem. Every time we have some kind of thought about how we're doing and how we compare to others, we're activating this ancient mammalian system. Now, how come this matters so much to the primates? Well, it turns out that if you were higher ranking and the stuff tends to be gendered and you know, among animals anyway, gender is seen as reasonably binary and, and it tends to be gendered. And basically being a higher ranking primate male meant that you were gonna have access to more reproductively promising females and the resources to take care of them and their kids. Basically your chances of passing your DNA on were higher, right? So the, here again, we could imagine primates hanging around, singing Kumbaya, not competitive, not worried about self-esteem, not worried about how they fit in in the ranking of primates, but they also weren't our ancestors because they didn't tend to reproduce as much. On the female side, it was basically angling to consort with the dominant males was the, um, was the biological uh, imperative. It's not that we don't have other instincts too. We have instincts toward cooperation and, and all sorts of things like that. But these are pretty powerful forces. And all we have to do is watch our own minds a little bit and see how often our mood goes up or down depending on self-esteem. 
you know, how we feel when we feel that people like us, how we feel when we're successful at things, when we get offered the job, when we get the A, when we get the promotion, when we look in the mirror and we think, hey, I don't look bad today. All of these different things activate this very primordial concern with social ranking. And one of the things we see through mindfulness practice is, my gosh, these self-evaluative, self-comparative thoughts, they're going on all day long. They occur in virtually every conversation we have with another person. And while we may not soar or sink each time, these things certainly affect us. And as though this weren't hard enough, we have another challenge to well-being. And that is basically that our existential predicament is tough. It basically, there's a psychoanalytic writer um, named Judith Fiorst, uh, and she wrote a book in the 1980s called Necessary Losses. And it was on the bookshelf of virtually every therapist back then. And uh, her premise was, you can understand a lot of human psychological distress by the difficulties we have dealing with change. And this starts very, very early. I don't wanna give up my diapers and start using the potty. The current arrangement suits me just fine. A little bit later, what are you kidding, school with all those strange other kids and that teacher person? I'd rather stay home with mommy or daddy. And it just goes on this way throughout the life cycle. I can attest from my current position that as I look forward with glee to various new developmental steps, things like assisted living and skilled nursing, you know, I have some resistance to change and some clinging to the current circumstance. Just check this out in your own experience, wherever you are in the life cycle, have any of you noticed any changes in your body since you were 20? Have you welcomed and embraced them all? This is a hard road, okay? And interestingly, mindfulness practices and other med meditative traditions evolved cross-culturally in order to address these kinds of fundamental difficulties. They evolved to address the fact that we have this bizarre juxtaposition of this thinking apparatus with this fight or flight stress response system so that we're constantly getting our stress response system triggered and activated. It's adaptive, yes, for survival, but it's terrible for well being. It feels horrible. They evolve because we're all preoccupied with social rank, with how we're doing, with comparing ourselves either to one another or comparing ourselves to some inner standard that we grew up with of who we think we're supposed to be. And unless you live in Lake Wobegon where, you know, all of the women are strong, all the men are good looking and all the children are above average, you're gonna come out on top sometimes and below sometimes. So we're constantly going up and down this way. And we live in a universe which is impermanent, right? Where everything changes. So everything that we hold near and dear, everything we love, everything we hold on to is going to slip through our fingers eventually, causing untold distress from us. We need help. Mindfulness practices evolved in many ways to help us. Let me uh, come out of uh, screen sharing for a little bit. So, the good news is that when we look at the factors that predict our well-being or not, we can influence them. Um, uh, you know, we're not simply, um, you know, doomed, uh, doomed to, uh, to some kind of fate here. Um, interestingly, um, well-being or happiness is subject to set points the same way, <clears throat> way it is. Um, it, just raise your hand if you've ever tried to gain or lose weight, right? Yeah, most of us have, right? And, uh, you know, you've probably learned that, yes, if, you're, if you restrict calories and you exercise a lot, your weight goes down. If you're particularly gluttonous and sedentary, your weight's going to go up. But if you don't do anything, it's going to gravitate towards something called the set point. It's going to gravitate toward kind of what your weight wants to be. And it turns out that our sense of well-being is quite similar. That if we don't do anything to either cultivate more well-being or do things that are particularly um, uh, detract from our well-being, what's going to happen is we're going to gravitate toward a certain set point. And uh, people have, have tried to um, analyze, well, what are the determinants of those set points? It turns out about 50% of the variance is genetic. Um, anybody who's raised more than one kid knows that they come into the world with different nervous systems and genes play a big role in just how easily we'll roll with the punches, how easily we'll adapt to changes, and whether we're going to be distressed or not. However, it turns out that about 40% of the variance is actually based on how we relate to our experience. And this is where mindfulness practices are going to come in, because 40% is a big chunk 
of what's going on. Fascinatingly, only 10% of the variance, 10% of the basically what contributes to us feeling good, happy, having a sense of well-being, or the opposite, has to do with our external circumstances. And this is really wild when you think of how much effort we put into trying to trigger our external circumstances to feel good, right? We try to get the right education, the right job, the right mate, try to give birth to the right kids. We, you know, we go through all sorts of things to try to come up with arranging the furniture, if you will, in our life so that we're going to be happy. And yet that only accounts for about 10% of the variance. You see this in countless studies, um, things like the studies of, uh, um, of uh, lottery winners that we'll talk about shortly that, you know, a few months after winning the lottery, they're back to their previous level of well-being. And one of the reasons um, why this happens is something that's called the hedonic treadmill by psychologists who study well-being. Hedonic from the same root as hedonism, having to do with pleasure. The way this works is we find something that makes us feel good. Let's say, oh, having a new relationship or getting a promotion and getting paid more or even getting that new car or losing five pounds, whatever it is, something comes, comes along, makes us feel good. And we, after a little while, we habituate because we humans habituate to everything. So what happens is we then need more and more in order to try to feel good again about ourselves. And uh, the limitation of the hedonic treadmill is uh, you know, it's, it's not limitless. You know, we can't always get more and more. And once we habituate to something, it stops working for us. So some of the classic things that don't work well are, as I mentioned with lottery winners, wealth. You know, once we've reached a certain level of uh, um, kind of good enough wealth so we don't have to worry about money for food and shelter, medical care. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, being impoverished and income inequality doesn't contribute to unhappiness, it certainly does. But once we reach what we might call a middle class level, then more money doesn't actually do it for us. It does for a little bit, we feel good for a little bit, but then we habituate and it fades. Um, I hate to say this to a Harvard audience, but education and even high IQ does not correlate to well-being. You probably know that hanging out in the Harvard community, right? You know plenty of really smart people who aren't that happy. Right? And, and that's because the factors that we're going to look at that actually contribute to well-being, they're, they're not particularly related to education. It's not that education isn't heuristically useful. It's not that it's not, you know, wonderful to live in a rich and interesting world and read interesting books. It's just it on its own isn't going to do it for us. Even sunny days don't work. They're, great, they're a great illustration of the hedonic treadmill. You know, if it's been, uh, you know, cold and rainy, I mean, we've had a lovely fall around here, so um, I don't have that experience recently, but you know what it's like to have cold and rainy times or, or um, uh, gray and uh, dark times in the winter, and then the sun comes out and it's warm, everybody feels good, right? So are we extrapolate? We say, well, people in Southern California must feel good all the time. No, people in Southern California habituate to this so that it no longer works for them. Um, and in fact, some of the happiest communities on the planet on, on, in America are in the, um, the upper Midwest where the weather is horrible, right? It's like hot and sticky and awful in the summer. There's a brief spring. <laughs> you, I mean, there's a brief fall and then it's brutally cold in the winter, a brief spring and then more hot and sticky, right? But if they've got closeness knit communities, we're going to go there um, as, as one of the, the sources for well-being and they're able to savor their lives, they wind up um, being happier. Even being young doesn't work. This is of some reassurance to uh, those of us looking forward to assisted living and uh, uh, skilled nursing. Uh, it turns out the CDC did a study, and I know the CDC is now not as trusted as it once was, but the old CDC did a study, and they found that um, uh, young people aged 20 to 24 were sad or distressed 3.4 days out of a month, but 65 to 74, only um, 2.3 days out of the month. And the, the researchers digging into this thought that basically what has happened is as people get older, they get it. They start to realize all the stuff that's subject to the hedonic treadmill and doesn't work to provide lasting well-being. And they start to shift their attention toward those things that, that work better. And how, and, and so, and let's now shift our attention to how mindfulness practices um, might help us with that. 
I think I'll come back to a little bit of screen sharing here. And let's, let's start here. Oops, nope, sorry. Okay, um, I assume since you're here already that most of you have some kind of meditation practice, probably includes some mindfulness, but just to give a few basics for those who might not. So mindfulness is we're using it in, uh, in Western um, healthcare and well-being circles, uh, tends to be a translation of a, so a Pali term. Now, uh, Pali was the vernacular language in which the teachings of the historical Buddha were first written down. And uh, the word in Pali is sati. And this isn't because there's anything necessarily Buddhist about mindfulness practices. I mentioned before, virtually all of the world's communities have developed some form of practice, but the, they've been developed in greater detail and um, we have greater records. We basically have the account of several thousand years, well, two and a half thousand years, of tens, and thousands, tens of thousands of monks and nuns uh, and hermits and the like who took up these practices at a very high dose. So that they were spending some 10,000 hours or more doing it. You know, those, the, uh, the, uh, the research that says, you get really good at something, you should spend 10,000 hours doing it. And they wrote about their experience. So we have a lot of practices uh, that get borrowed or modified from these Buddhist traditions. And the term for mindfulness in Pali is sati. And it connotes awareness, intention, and remembering. And the awareness and attention are pretty much the way we use them in English, to be aware and pay attention. But the remembering is different. It's not about remembering what you had for breakfast, or even for that matter, remembering childhood trauma. It's about remembering to be aware and pay attention. So this is about developing the intention, moment by moment, to pay attention to what's happening in our lives. And there's a, there's a metaphor that, um, that Buddhist scholars uh, talk about sometimes. And... Um, talking about what is what might be missing from this concept of awareness, attention, and remembering. And they say, imagine a sniper is poised on top of a building, getting ready to take out an innocent victim. That sniper would be very aware, very attentive, and every time his mind wandered from the task at hand, he'd be coming right back in. And those folks say, I'm not sure sniper consciousness is exactly the path to well-being that we're looking for here. Something's missing. And what's missing is a sense of non-judgment, acceptance, adding a kind of kindness or friendliness um, to the attitude. And uh, so we might say that therapeutic mindfulness is awareness of present experience with loving acceptance. And when we practice, we notice that the mind is quite busy. It's filled with thoughts. It jumps from uh, around from place to place. As this has been, um, as mindfulness practices have been integrated into psychotherapy a great deal in recent years, uh, there's been some dismantling of them and trying to see so exactly which components are most powerful in terms of generating well-being. And it turns out it's not our ability to, to pay attention that's what's so important. It's not necessarily our ability to, to be rigidly one-pointed with attention. It's rather our capacity for loving acceptance. And uh, to understand loving acceptance, I invite you to take a look with me at this picture of this puppy. And I want you to just notice what you feel in your heart as you look at him. And if you would uh, raise your hand if what mostly you experience is a sense of harsh critical judgment. If that happens, email me later and we'll, we'll talk about resources. But most of us look at him and we experience what we might call the universal sound of human love or human compassion, something like, oh, right? Now, what's interesting is even if this puppy pees and poops at the wrong time, even if he doesn't listen to instructions, we're gonna think he's young, He's just a puppy, he needs love, he needs more training. One of the things we discover when we take up meditation practices, mindfulness in particular, is the mind does pee and poop at the wrong time. It does not listen to instructions. We have this image that, oh, I'm gonna sit down and meditate, I'm gonna be so zen, I'm gonna be just in the present, and I'm just gonna experience states of bliss. 
sorry, that's not actually what happens. We sit down and we notice what a wreck we are. We notice just how filled our minds are with all sorts of um, uh, jumping around and, and uh, distressing thoughts. In fact, I think I will share with you, let's, let's see if I can pull it up quickly here. Um, let's see, it's something from a book I'm, I'm working on here. Um, and that uh, it, it's just a, um, a quote that I find uh, uh, particularly um, entertaining here. I'll see if I can pull it up very quickly and share it with you. Okay. Um, uh, this is this is very nice to keep in mind when you're uh, uh, when you're involved in uh, meditation practice and you're you're starting to get critical of the puppy mind. This is from a Buddhist monk, uh, Bhante Guanarantana, or Guan, I don't know how to pronounce it so well. People call him Bhante G. <clears throat> Somewhere in this process, you will come face to face with the sudden and shocking realization that you are completely crazy. Your mind is a shrieking, gibbering madhouse on wheels, barreling pell-mell down the hill, utterly out of control and hopeless. No problem. You are not crazier than you were yesterday. It has always been this way, and you are also no crazier than everybody else around you. So we need this attitude when, let's come back to our puppy here. We need this attitude when we become uh, critical of the puppy. And it turns out that having some way to have this attitude, an attitude of acceptance of whatever arises in the mind, no matter how unenlightened it may seem, is actually a very important part of using these practices um, uh, toward in inching toward sanity. The other thing we find from the research, which is very interesting, and this is actually, I, I include this here because it's a Harvard study. Um, there was a, uh, a Harvard graduate student um, by the name of uh, Matthew Killingsworth, who was working in Dan Gilbert's lab. Dan Gilbert um, uh, has studied happiness and fallacies about happiness. He wrote a book, um, Stumbling Upon Happiness, that many of you may be familiar with. Anyway, Killingsworth came up with this idea, um, probably was 10 years ago or so now, of creating a cell phone app that would page people at random intervals throughout the day. And it would ask people to note three things. What are you doing? Where's your attention right now? And how are you feeling? And as it turned out, first of all, people reported that their mind was not paying attention to what they were doing some 47 plus percent of the time. I consider that a very low estimate. I think uh, as we start to practice mindfulness, we notice we develop what's called higher resolution consciousness. The ability, they call it that at Google. The ability to see um, what's happening in the mind more clearly more pixels per square centimeter, if you will, of awareness. And we start to notice, my gosh, the mind is almost always, always wandering. In fact, if you were to ask somebody who is a, um, uh, a long time meditator, you know, who's been at it for a few decades and you say, so how often are you aware of your present experience with acceptance? They'll say, well, I remember once I was sitting in silent retreat and we were somewhere in the second week and I was sitting on this grassy knoll and, you know, for about, could have been five seconds, maybe even 10 seconds, I was actually fully present. And then it passed like all things do. Um, whereas if you ask somebody who's new to mind from the track, they say, sure, I'm aware of my present experience with acceptance all the time. So the 47%, I think, is a low estimate. However, in the perhaps even more interesting finding, Killingsworth found that what predicted whether or not people had a sense of well being had little to do with what they were doing. The main predictor was were they present for what they were doing? So to use some stark examples, if the person, let's say they responded to their page while doing the dishes, eating a gourmet meal or making love, what mattered wasn't what they were doing, it was whether they were paying attention. The person who was able to pay attention to the dishes actually reported greater well-being than the person who was, if they answered the page, making love but whose mind was elsewhere, right? 
so one of the things that we're going to um, practice here with mindfulness is increasingly being present and we're going to practice it with increased acceptance. And I want to um, mention one other thing and then, and then we'll talk specifically about how mindfulness can help us with this and uh, we'll do a little bit of practice together. Another thing that comes out of the research on well-being, and here's another Harvard study, is that safe social connection is critical. So this is the Harvard study of adult development. You can Google it. It's, it's a fascinating study. And you can Google a great TED talk by Bob Waldinger, who's a psychiatrist at Mass General Hospital, Harvard faculty, who is currently shepherding the study. And what they've been doing is they've been studying 724 men for the last 75 plus years, since 1938. And half of them were Harvard students. They're all men because Harvard was all male back then. And half of them were poor young men living in tenements and stuff in the Boston area. 60 of these guys are still alive. And originally they were doing uh, interviews and survey questions and measuring their health the best they could in the 1930s. And increasingly they got into doing lipid levels and you know, indicate indicators of, um, of inflammation. And they thought, hey, we should interview their wives and partners. Uh, we should interview their kids. And they, they got more and more detailed in, in what they were studying. And uh, Bob would tell you that the jury is now in. We now know from this study, and the same was true of the poor guys and the, the quite privileged guys who were Harvard students at the time. The jury is now in about both what predicts um, physical longevity as well as, as well as predicting well-being. And the most, predict the most important predictor was the quality of their relationships. And the interesting thing was, it didn't mean that the relationships had to be harmonious. You know, it wasn't like, you know, everybody's all peace and light and zen. The relationships had to be deeply trusting. They had to be relationships in which the, the men felt that their partners, their friends had their backs and they had the other people's backs. And there's a lot of studies about meaning and connection as pathways toward well-being. Basically, whenever we're engaged for the benefit of something larger than ourselves. Uh, one of the classic studies was done at the University of Toronto, where um, they gave people money at the beginning of the day and they randomized them to two groups. And one group had to spend the money on themselves. The other group had to spend their money on anyone other than themselves for the, for the benefit of, of someone else. Guess which group was feeling better at the end of the day. When we do things out of generosity, we do better. Okay, so my premise here is that mindfulness practices and compassion practices are helpful for counteracting all of these forces that tend to make us unhappy, tend to detract from well-being, and tend to move us in, instead toward well-being. Okay, and uh, so how do they do this? Well, uh, first of all, when we're practicing mindfulness, as you know, what we're doing is we're you know, let's do it this way. Let's do just a, a few minutes of mindfulness practice together, and then we'll use this practice as something to reference to talk about how, mindful, how mindfulness works. So I invite you, if you're, if you're in a place, if you're not, you know, driving or something, um, find a comfortable and alert posture and close your eyes. And all we're going to do for about five minutes is tune in to sensory reality. So just notice what it's like to be sitting. Notice the sensations of contact with the chair and the floor. Sensations in your feet, the back of your legs your back if it's leaning against the chair. Notice the contact with the ocean of sound we inhabit. My voice, any other sounds in the background.
notice this, the subtle sensations of contact with the sea of air we live in. Feel the air on your face, your hands, any other exposed areas. Notice the temperature of the air. Perhaps you'll notice with each breath that the air enters the nostrils a little bit cool and leaves a little bit warmer. And then leaving the eyes gently closed, notice the sensations in the interior of the body. Any aches or pressures or discomfort. And notice in particular that the breath is there. If all is going well this afternoon, you're already breathing. In fact, more accurately, the body is breathing itself because it doesn't require our attention to do it. And see if you might follow the breath through its full cycles from the beginning of an in-breath to that point of fullness back down to the end of an out breath and on to the next. Now it would not be unusual for thoughts to enter the mind. <clears throat> That's really okay, they're our friends. We're not trying to banish them or get rid of them. But instead of following each chain of narrative thought as we ordinarily would, as soon as you notice that your attention's been hijacked from the breath to the thought stream, just gently and lovingly, like you were training that puppy, bring the attention back to the breath. And now finally, I invite you to listen to the sound of a bell that I'm gonna ring and just listen until the sound trails off and can no longer be heard. You can open your eyes again. And um, just take a moment, just look around the room you're in and notice the way even those, this brief period of stepping out of the thought stream a little bit develops a little bit of this higher resolution consciousness. You might be able to notice colors or textures or perhaps details in the room that were not so apparent before. It doesn't take much to begin to train us 
to be a little bit more present, a little bit more fully here. And then finally, and then I'll, I'll open this up to some questions and discussion. I'd just like to explain how this a practice as simple as this might help us with all of the different ways our brains evolve to make us unhappy, right? All of these different survival mechanisms. Um, the first one is simply training the mind, training the brain to step out of the thought stream and anchor attention in sensory reality in the present helps to interrupt this linkage between thought and psychophysiological arousal or a stress response system. Take a moment right now to think of something that is kind of upsetting to you. Please don't pick the worst thing ever in your life, but just something which is annoying or upsetting or maybe a little difficulty that came up today. At this very moment, if it weren't for the thought of the thing, would you be having a problem? And most of us realize, well, no, actually. In this moment, sitting wherever you are, you're probably safe, you're probably at a reasonable temperature, you've probably had enough nutrients, you know, you're probably not actually in danger, but the thought of this thing happening is what creates the danger. That was, you know, the bunny's problem, right? Imagining what's gonna happen with the fox and with, um, with his 403B. So simply practicing stepping out of the thought stream helps us to not believe so much in our thoughts. We develop what, what psychologists call metacognitive awareness, which is the awareness that a thought is a thought rather than a representation of reality. Another way that these practices help us is they increase our capacity to be with discomfort. Had we meditated for, let's say, 20 or 30 minutes instead of just five, there would have probably been some point where either an itch or an ache would have arisen. And the standard instruction is, instead of immediately scratching the itch or adjusting our posture to alleviate the ache, try turning our attention toward the sensation, which is difficult, and open to it and be with it in a loving way and see what happens. And very often what we find is it, it, it changes on its own after a while. This discovery that physical discomfort changes on its own after a while, starts to become enormously helpful in working with emotional discomfort because emotional discomfort is physical discomfort. Again, take a moment, just very briefly, close your eyes and generate just a little bit of sadness. Again, not the saddest thing ever, but something that brings up some sadness. And maybe place your hand on the part of your body where you feel this, the physical sensations associated with sadness. And now shift to anxiety or fear a little bit. Feel a little bit of something that worries you and notice where you feel that. And you can open your eyes again. We could go through all the emotions, joy, anger, um, shame, everything, and notice that emotions are actually somatic events. They're things we feel in our body, right? Accompanied by a thought or an image. Probably some of you use the thought, some use an image to generate the emotion. And as we practice mindfulness and as we practice staying with sensations, including uncomfortable sensations and noticing that they're transient and they keep changing, it helps. We get better at being with the discomfort so we don't have to frantically um, do something to avoid it. Additionally, our preoccupation with ourself is very, very centered in our narratives about ourselves. When our self-esteem is going up or down, it's going up or down with the thought of, hey, I'm doing a great job teaching right now, or oh, this isn't going so well, or you know, I'm a good meditator, or I'm a bad meditator, or I'm lovable, or I'm not lovable. Whatever, whatever's going on here, our self-esteem ups and downs, our, our sense of, of where we rank in our primate troop that's always fluctuating and causes us a lot of grief, um, all of this is tied to thoughts about who we think we are, these narratives we construct about, you know, I'm Ron, I'm a psychologist, I teach mindfulness, I, you know, th these stories we create about ourselves, I'm, and I'm either a good father or a bad father. And the more we practice mindfulness, the less we believe in these stories, the more we're able to see that they're just stories, and we start to see our interrelatedness. This is a little bit of the spiritual dimension of mindfulness practices. And by spiritual here, I don't mean, you know, supernatural in some sense, I mean simply a 
appreciating interconnectedness and we start to see our interconnectedness more and that seeing our interconnectedness more and being less preoccupied with how I'm doing, those factors are going to help us to be able to get along better with one another. Because what, what gets in the way of getting along with one another is invariably this self-esteem stuff. You know, you did, I can't believe you did that to me after all I've done for you and on and on and on and on, right? So mindfulness practices actually help with all of these different hardwired propensities of the brain to make ourselves unhappy. And they give us instead the opportunity to savor experience. So I think I'm going to um, uh, stop talking, but I wanted to share a couple of resources with you, and then um, we'll have time for um, a question or two. Um, what I want to share with you are, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, mostly this. Um, the the, the um, the organizers will give you an opportunity to let me have your email address. Um, and whoops. And if you let me have your email address, I will send you um, some handouts, the supports for developing a mindfulness practice and that discuss some of these, um, uh, some of these topics that we've just uh, um, talked about. I also want to give you a resource. Um, some years ago, I wrote a book that's about developing mindfulness practices. You see it on your screen, The Mindfulness Solution, Everyday Practices for Everyday, Everyday Problems. And it goes through how to develop a mindfulness practice and then how to use these practices to work with everyday anxiety, depression, interpersonal conflicts, the challenges of aging, you know, all these kinds of things that, that, um, that beset all of us. And um, there's a website, uh, www, you don't need the www anymore these days, but mindfulness-solution.com. And um, perhaps um, one of uh, our organizers can put mindfulness-solution.com into the chat uh, so that you can just click on it. And there are all sorts of meditations that you can download for free um, connected to, uh, to the book, but the scripts and the explanations um, are in the book. So with that, why don't we take um, a moment and maybe time for one or two observations or questions or, or thoughts. And you're probably all familiar with this because we spend a lot of time Zooming, but there's a, uh, a hand raising function um, in the participants window. If you click on participants and you'll see the opportunity to raise your hand. And uh, if you do that, then I'll be able to call on you and you can unmute yourself. So um, Shruti Kumar, um, um, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and uh, Let's, let's talk. Hi, um, yeah, my name is Shruti Kumar and I'm a first year at the college this year. So thank you so much for your presentation today. I really enjoyed um, everything you had to say and your insights about the evolution of mindfulness. Um, my question is like very frequently, I notice myself, like you said, my mood changing depending on our external influences. So I guess like on a day-to-day -day basis, like I've been practicing mindfulness meditation since I was very young, but I still find myself, find it difficult to, um, you know, reduce the impact of those external influences on myself and my well-being. So what are, what are your suggestions, tips, thoughts about how we can mitigate the impact of our external influences on our internal well-being? Well, first, be kind to yourself about this, because I've been doing it since I was about 17. And if, if the video is okay and your vision's okay, you'll realize that was some time ago. And I'm still going up and down with what happens with these external situations. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we have the fantasy that the results of these practices is going to be just that, that we're going to get into the state of equanimity in which we're not going to be ruffled by what happens, um, that we'll be able to stop the waves of our life in some way. What actually happens more so is we learn how to surf. Uh, it's more that we get comfortable with the fact that, oh, here's my self-esteem soaring because I feel like, um, I, like my professor just like what, liked what I said. I'm, I'm going to make a great assumption here, but oh, here's my self-esteem crashing because to get into Harvard, I used to be at the top of my class and now I'm just like everybody else. What happened to being special? Not to say this is happening to you, but I work with a lot of Harvard students over the years and it does happen to others. And you know, all of these kinds of changes, instead of being critical of ourselves and thinking, you know, gee, how come I'm not past this? Recognize this is hardwired. This is built into our primate nature. We're constantly going to be evaluating ourselves, comparing ourselves to one another. And let me learn to ride the waves, but not take them quite as seriously. 
In other words, the waves will come, but it's like, oh, here I am, here, here we go again. And also we can, we can work with our behavior a little bit. We can get it over time that, you know, I don't think the answer is gonna lie in trying to stay on top. Um, Cause I'm just gonna recalibrate. This is what happens, you get to Harvard, you're suddenly recalibrating. It's like, uh, I went from being a superstar to being average. Again, I'm not presupposing for you, but it happens to a lot of students. And uh, you start to re Olympic gold medalists, you know, terribly disappointed because they won the bronze next year. You won a bronze, me but it doesn't work anymore. So it's sort of seeing the patterns and then we put less of our energy in, into trying to um, find happiness through success in these different ways and more toward savoring, toward connecting to other people, toward turning our attention to these things, but just accepting that the waves are still gonna come, we're just gonna get better at surfing them. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, Karim uh, Sarhan, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name uh, properly. That's correct. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. My question is on the negativity bias that we inherited as, as, as you described. Is there a way to deal with that by reasoning with the ideas that in the first place created this negativity bias, saying that these dangers that used to be there thousands of years ago are no longer there. So why am I having this negativity bias until now? Well, there, 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 so there are different ways to try to work our way out of the negativity bias. One of them is, you know, um, in cognitive behavior therapy, they do what you're, pres what, what you're suggesting. Um, the idea is, let's see if the argument is fallacious. You know, maybe the, you know, the argument is wrong when, you know, when, when um, uh, I'm walking down, you know, I'm walking across the quad and somebody who's, you know, who I think of as a friend or a new friend or something, you know, passes not that far from me and doesn't acknowledge me and, and my mind starts to sink and go into, oh God, you know, they didn't like what I said the other day. Oh gosh, you know, they don't really like me that much. You know, we can have a counter argument that says, wait a minute, there's your mind going down that rabbit hole again. It could be that my friend's mind is on something else and they're preoccupied about their own self-esteem, not about me, you know? And, and so we can sometimes manage this by, um, uh, through counter argument, if you will. Um, but, uh, but I would argue that it's very helpful to have a regular mindfulness practice because then we see these blips coming up and we also start to see the way our thoughts are so dependent on whatever our emotion is at the moment. You know, it's, uh, you know, when we're in a good mood, we're suddenly imagining wonderful, bountiful futures. And, and like when we're in a bad mood, it's all bleak and dark. You know, we, you know, we start to, the more we practice mindfulness, the more we develop this metacognitive uh, perspective, which is, is really the ability to not believe in the thought so much. And, and the interesting shift that's happened in cognitive behavior therapy over the last uh, decade or so was a shift from let's fix the broken thoughts by helping people to think more rational, more adaptive thoughts to, you know, let's help people to become skeptical of all of their thinking by stepping out of the thought stream more. Because um, there, there are basically two huge findings from cognitive science, and I, I think we may have to end with these. Um, and this is the last 20 years of cognitive science. The first finding is we are hopelessly, hopelessly biased and irrational. Uh, we see this in the, you know, all of the attention being um, put on uh, systemic and institutional racism. Well, there's also all the personal racism, you know. Um, if you're interested in this, another throw, um, uh, another uh, shout out to a Harvard institution, um, the Implicit Bias Project, okay? You can Google that, it's, it's housed at Harvard, uh, which is a, a number of, of um, tests you can take that will show you your prejudices. Don't do this if you're fragile today, because it's, it's horrifying to see this. I, I thought, I had taught about it for years and I thought, okay, you know, I'm getting to be an old guy, I'll do the one on age-related bias, because then if I find out that I'm horribly bigoted, at least I'm in the afflicted class. I'm hor horribly bigoted against people my own age, is what I discover. So we discover these things. So the first discovery is we are all hopelessly biased in our cognitions. The other big discovery from cognitive science is we all think we are rational actors. We think that our perceptions are the accurate one, other people are biased. And all you have to do is glance at the political arena and just look at the symmetry between 
the two political parties and advocates of the two political parties, they're all absolutely convinced that they're seeing reality clearly and the other group is deluded. So um, the more we see how fallible, and I'm not arguing against political action, in fact, please vote, but the, um, but the more we can see how our, um, how our cognitive views are shaped by emotion, the, um, uh, the better able will be to not, not believe in them so much. So I'm sorry that we're not going to have time for other questions, but I think we're at the end of our hour here. Thank you everybody for, um, you know, for joining in and, uh, for, um, uh, for listening. And I hope that this inspires you a little bit to continue practicing because, uh, um, practicing helps us be a little bit saner. So, uh, so be well, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Could we please unmute ourselves and, and give a round of applause? <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.